coming to you from Orange County, California. This is the Jug Life Podcast with Max Ada and Chad Wesley Smith. Hey everybody, Chad Wesley Smith here, bringing you another episode of the Jug Life Podcast. I'm joined as always... Magnificent, marvelous Max Montana. Thank you, Chad. How are you guys doing? <laughs> that was a that was a very complimentary. That both was, magnificent and marvelous. Yes, that was incredible. Uh, Max gets in a bad mood. He's malevolent, Max Montana. <laughs> Could be sometimes mischievous, yeah. Max Montana. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot of M <laughs> alliteration that can go on there. Yeah, um, we'll run out of them eventually. That's for sure. <laughs> mischievous, Max Montana. I like that one. The mischievous. That's the Max Montana that's had. Four, possibly five High West Stouts. <laughs> oh, I still have the scar. It's actually it's formed into an actual scar now. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. One, one day the, the viewers can uh, know about the story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today's pro- podcast is brought to you by Milligrams and Kilograms. They were very excited to sponsor this episode as oh, we yeah. discuss the new Netflix documentary, Icarus. Um, this is a movie by director and star Brian Fogel and features Grigory Rodchenkov. Uh, it becomes, I guess, really becomes the star of it. But a uh, zany cast. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so if you you haven't seen it yet, you probably want to watch it before you, uh, you listen to this podcast for the, the spoiler alert, so spoiler you've alert. been properly warned. So people are taking drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's already happened in real life, so yeah, maybe I guess it's it not a spoiler not. alert. Well, but anyways, yeah, watch watch the movie before you listen to the podcast. I think not the not the other way yeah, around. around. Uh, so it just released maybe a, a week, two weeks ago, at the time that you're watching this, and Max and I watched it last night. Phenomenal. Yeah. Incredibly well done. Yeah. Interesting. You feel for the, the the people in it. Like it it's a documentary, but you, you really got was, yeah. kind of attached to yeah. uh Rodchenko for sure. Like a yeah. like a movie character. Yeah. Uh, it was it was a very it was a very well done documentary, I mean, aside from the, the subject matter. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was good. What what were your impressions going into the movie? What what were you expecting? Uh you know, I thought it was going to be, I thought it was going to be much more like, I don't want to say like buy it, like, I thought it was going to be much more of just like a look at how bad and like all these people, that, like all the Russians, all the people doing the doping and this whole thing is just these evil people. But I thought it did a good job of sort of showing the human side to, you know, Rachenkov and then what, you know, where he was at, but also possibly like showing the the side of like there's there's people involved it's not just this evil machine mm-hmm. that's you know um that's kind of churning out these people i mean it, obviously there's a huge component but i was thinking it was just going to be this totally like uh you know sort of fluff piece of like whatever russia's evil they take drugs and they cheat yeah, it largely is, but it's, just it's do- done well. Yeah. Just the documentary version yeah. of the part of Rocky IV where Ivan Drago <laughs> is getting his punching power yeah. measured From and a, then yeah. extreme close-ups extreme, of syringes. Extreme <laughs> syringe close-up. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that was my expectation, right? And then, but, it, you know, it was, it was, it was in-depth enough that I thought it was pretty cool to see that, the characters. Yeah, you know, the, the previews of it that I had seen... And what I knew of it before I watched it, I expected a much different oh, really? movie in that I expected, you know, if you've seen the movie Super Size Me with Morgan Spurlock or he eats McDonald's every day, I was expecting this movie to be that. And, and I thought the, at least the preview that I saw alluded much more to this, yeah. that, that the movie was going to be about um, Brian Fogel, the director, taking steroids, trying to beat drug tests and doing this bicycle race. And it, it does, it starts out like that, but it turned into so much yeah. more. And I think particularly interesting to us and, and hopefully the the listeners and, and viewers of the podcast, because over the last year, you know, maybe 18 months that we've been doing Jug Life Podcast, uh, without a doubt, our most popular 
topic even more popular than making fun of high multiply squats has <laughs> been positive drug tests, has been doping scandal related to Russia, yeah. related to you know retroactive testing and, and all this stuff that went around the 2016 Olympics. Um, and this, this movie goes so, so in-depth to that. Yeah, you know, it's funny because we were talking, too, that when we, when we watch it, we've been around a lot of these stories and people. And, you know, I had experience, you had experience with Klokov, and I had experience with Abdreyev, like people that are in the thick of what's going on. And they, they'll tell you the honest story. But it's hard to grasp because the way they present it is usually from, like, their side of, like, it's always... There's a little hyperbole here and there, or you don't know exactly what it is. They just try to make the point, like, oh, yeah, it's like everybody in Russia does, you know, does doping and this and that. But you don't really grasp what that means. The film does a great job of highlighting the, the like, depth to which this thing was going on. Yeah. Whereas, like, the stories we got. So going into it, you're not surprised, like, oh, my God, everyone's doping in Russia. But then you start to realize the actual thing, like, holy shit, everybody in <laughs> Russia is doping. And, like, it sets in a lot more. Even though we had a ton of experience with those people in the stories before and kind of knowing it, I thought that was pretty pretty cool. And I think one of, one of the big differences is, is the way that sport is organized in Russia versus America. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of, kind of across the board, that whether it's, you know, holdovers of communist system versus capitalism here, but there's a much more centralized organization for the sport governing bodies, uh, individual sport governing bodies, as well as this ministry of sport. Yeah. <laughs> and there, there is a government official called the Minister of Sport. That, that does not exist in America. No, no, not at all. Where in the, in the U.S., whether it's weightlifting, it's track and field, whatever, it's, you know, this little camp over here versus this team, this team, this yeah. team. And they're all kind of doing their their own thing and we'll we'll talk about the kind of implications of that a bit more later but uh with that centralized system it lends itself much more to this overreaching right. overarching conspiracy corruption right right it affecting everyone not just these three or four people who train at this place or whatever it is yeah it's not just like pockets right yeah. there's no like oh this one club is doing drugs you know and this other one's not like it's it's that that's just entire everything is interconnected yeah right yeah and and there's money to interconnect right all of it right. and support um so if you haven't watched it do that do it before you listen to the rest of this i mean 10 out of 10 yeah two thumbs up yeah very good five stars yeah. other truffle shuffle <laughs> yeah Three truffle shuffles. Is that a full <laughs> no. top rating? It's the three. highest rating you get on a truffle shuffle. It's three of them in a row. Yeah. So the, the movie really, it starts out, and, and this is going to be you know, a bit of recap and then our kind of analysis yeah. along the way, uh, whether some of that's anecdotal or just our interpretation of, of things. Um, the movie starts out with the director, Brian Fogel, uh, discussing his desire to compete in this amateur bike race, this very competitive amateur bike race that he had done the year before, and I believe gotten 14th in it. and Clean, totally natural. Yeah. And, and his idea was, okay, I'm going to come back and do this bike race, but do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dope through it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Lance Armstrong the situation. You yeah. know, he came with Lance Armstrong being his, his hero, kind of growing up in the world of cycling, and and he's going to Lance Armstrong this this race and and document the whole thing, and try and sort of expose this system right. of oh you know doping doesn't really work you know like so many YouTube commenters Brian Fogel yeah. had the same idea well it's it's so easy it's so easy to beat right well I think the whole thing too that was kind of inspired him was that Lance Armstrong never actually failed a drug test correct he had been tested many, like, dozens and dozens of times, possibly hundreds of times. Yeah, I, th- I think the number they quote in the movie is 150 times. 150 tests, right? And never a single positive. So and he won seven Tour de France's, so that's, let's say, 20 tests uh, twenty tests a year, a couple, a couple more than that, probably more yeah. as he went. Yeah. Which, in the grand scheme of drug I testing... I thought they had said 500. Was it 500? I thought it was 500 total tests. Okay. That would make more sense because yeah. that would be what about a hundred a year? No, 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 less, Maybe, less yeah, than about eighty, years, seven, seventy-five a year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that certainly much harder to beat. But yeah, in the grand scheme of drug testing, from people 
we've talked to Jordan Clark, who was a, a world championship Mm. Uh, team shot putter who we had on last year told us that he was tested 50 times <laughs> in in the year. You don't even need um, a toilet bowl anymore. Yeah, the, uh, I heard about Usain Bolt at at least 2012, if if not 2008 Olympics, being tested like 14 times during the week of the Olympics, complaining about the testing process to the point of like they're waking me up at one or two in the morning. Like how much blood are they going to draw here right, like right. i need this blood for energy right. to do <laughs> like that is hey, can we push back the uh the start of the hundred here i just yeah. i just donated blood so that is nuts. yeah um so very prevalent drug testing but a couple notes uh about lance armstrong drug testing think you know whatever you think about lance armstrong i'm very much of the opinion that yeah, you know, he was not Lance Armstrong's crime was not taking drugs to win the Tour de France because they've shown that he would have been going down to the fiftieth place person uh, who was actually clean. Maybe if you if you wanted to take everyone out who was on drugs, so that was not. You know, if, if Lance Armstrong is a bad guy, it's not because he took drugs uh, to win the Tour de France. It's probably because <laughs> it's a fucking bad dude. <laughs> yeah, people who, who pointed out that he was taking drugs, he went to. Extreme. extreme measures to ruin their lives but it's like well does the end justify the means of raising all this money that's a, a different uh, yeah that's a, a different, different debate but uh something important to note about lance armstrong's drug testing is that the uci uh the governing the world governing organization for cycling at the time their ratio and you know mm. test to epitestosterone ratio is sort of the the number one uh you know, the, the first step of drug testing is establishing this ratio was 10 to 1. 10 to 1 testosterone to epitestosterone ratio, while, you know, track and field was 6 to 1 and might even be 4 to yeah, 1. Yeah, it's 4 to 1 now. And yeah. I think, like, an average human, normal person it's is 1, one to 1, one yeah. 2 to 1 is high. And certainly there's probably people walking around at 4 to 1 or whatever. But yeah. But uh, I think uh, was it Alistair Overeem was fifty three to one or something one one of the times he tested yeah. and tried to claim that that was all. Well, he's yeah. just a very he's just a better man. man. He's yeah. a real man. I saw like, I saw him in Thailand. Uh, yeah, yeah, in the hospital. Yeah, a couple of syringes sticking out of his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something, you know, brush that off. <laughs> yeah, but ten ten to one was the the acceptable ratio. So if if I was to have to guess of who would naturally have higher testosterone. You know, gold medal shot putter or Tour de France cyclists. Flash a picture of Lance Armstrong here <laughs> flexing. Yeah. I'm going with the shot putter. So to give the to give the cyclists already twice as much leeway before having an issue seem seems like well they were really making it easy for Lance right. to beat it. And in one of the documentaries, um, there are so many documentaries about Lance Armstrong now, and the name of this one escapes me. I I know it's it's not the the one that stop at nothing. It's not that one. I'll Master of Spin. Is that one of them? That, that's what I'm pretty sure it's a documentary. Yeah, <laughs> about Lance Armstrong. Or? I thought it was like Lance Armstrong's workout video, but it's actually a <laughs> documentary on his uh, destruction of other people's lives. <laughs> um, but in it, in it, he mentions that uh, oh, the Armstrong lie. Oh. I think that's that's the one that that uh, he references. This is that. All the tests when he would get close to ten to one ratio, mm. the UCI was like warning him. They're like, "Hey, you're getting right. close." So, how many tests did he have that would have been over six to one, over the track and field standard right. at the time, but less than ten to one? That's a lot of leeway. So, you know, in in the the argument of well, it's easy to beat drug tests at that time. Certainly, the UCI was making it pretty easy on yeah. him, rel- just relative to even other sports, yeah. but. So Brian Fogel, the director, sets out to make this movie to to dope and to to do better in this bike race and to beat the tests. In it, he begins to enlist the help of Don Catlin, who is the uh, director of the UCL, UCLA lab. He invented the test for HGH, one of the most prominent figures in American drug testing, USADA, you know, WADA, alongside uh, the aptly named Dick Pound, uh, one of the real prominent characters. Dick Pound. Yes. One of the real prominent characters of the uh, U.S. anti-doping movement. So he talks to Don Catlin. He hires you know, a trainer and nutritionist, uh, anti-aging specialists, all to help him with this. And uh, 
I read got a three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar one of his Advanced, friends. Right. Yeah, one of his friends funded the the film and the process with three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and eventually Don Catlin realizes like, yeah, this is probably too much to help this guy beat. Yeah, I didn't want the, to tarnish his reputation, yeah. like showing that he could help this guy pass a test, and then. Yeah, that would just look bad, I think. Yeah. and Smart move. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> so in that, Don Catlin decides to like, hey, I'm going to take a step back, but I know a guy <laughs> who will okay. be more than willing to help you out. Yeah. And boy, does he know a guy. Yes. That is a one-of-a-kind yeah. man. <laughs> Maybe it's just editing or whatever, but at this point, he introduces uh, Brian Fogel to Gregory Rodchenkov. A very, very Russian <laughs> yes. man. The, uh, who is the head, uh, the director of the WADA accredited lab in Russia. And maybe it's just the way that the film is edited, but it gives the impression that Catlin, you know, gives him uh, Grigori's Skype name. He Skypes him and it's like, hi, my name's Brian. I'm Grigori. Oh, you have a cool dog. I have a cool dog too. Look, uh, so... Beating drug tests, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like no vetting process. Wow. No, like there's no like secret say, handshake. I, I or will code say word. that, and I'm not gonna. I probably shouldn't like, whatever. I'm gonna name names, whatever. But oh, and it's there's. I think there's a. If it was, if you had been anybody else contacting, uh, Rodchenkov, like definitely there may have been a, a much more resisting kind of force. Like oh, well, you know, I don't know who you are if you're a. Uh, a sort of outsider, but when I, whenever I was, a- I've asked the people that coached the best lifters, what did they take? No hesitation. This much of this, this much of that. He did this and this and this, and that's when he did this number. Like there's very, there's no resistance to it. And there may be if you're like, if you're just a, you know, you run up to somebody at whatever world championships, and, hey, Kolo, <laughs> how much did you take? Like you're not gonna get an answer. <laughs> but when you have some rapport because you're a lifter or yeah. a coach, or you're, you're one of the peers, like it might be a little different. So I could see where maybe that would be the case because it was very similar. Like, and and maybe Don know, Catlin had he, contact yeah. uh, yeah. Gregory and sort of said, hey, this guy's cool. To yeah. Help him out. I prefer to just think he's, that's what he's doing. And, yeah, but yeah. it was so just nonchalant, just <laughs> casual. Like, oh, you're interested in yeah. beating drug tests? Cool. That's what I do. Yeah. Well, he's also yeah. he works for USADA, right? Or no, no, not USADA. Uh, for WADA. He works at the WADA laboratory. Yeah, he is he, the director of the WADA <laughs> lab. So they, they go on for about six months, kind of corresponding back and forth, freezing urine and uh, smuggling that to Russia and so on and so forth. Uh, for an important part of trying to beat the drug testing process in this is getting your own sample tested in a WADA accredited lab. But guess what? People on the internet who think like, oh, it's so easy to beat the tests, you know, you can't just Google the the name of the lab and be like, hey, can I send my, my stuff there and you tell me if I pass or not? No, you have to have like contracts through SADA, through WADA, through these these organizations. We know people who have tried to do this. Yes, yeah. Yeah, very much. It's not you <laughs> yeah. can't just mail urine to a, a laboratory and get yeah. the 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 full IOC panel, right? They just yeah. won't do it because they know exactly why you're doing that. <laughs> yeah. So, Brian Fogel goes through about 6 months of training with these professional coaches with with doing testosterone, HDH, EPO, uh corresponding with uh Rodchenkov. Uh, working with nutritionists, all this stuff, and and does definitely see improvements being yielded in his performance. Uh, I know he quotes from going at 250 watts maximum up to about 350 watts. Yeah. Uh, that's a very significant improvement. Now it comes it comes time, and and Rodchenko comes to the U.S. and they kind of become buddies, and that's that's all great. It comes time for him to do the race. He travels to France. Very important things to note. Uh, an important takeaway from this movie is Brian Vogel does the race. Yes, he has a mechanical problem with his, his bike in it, but he does not do any better than he did the year before. By his own admission, he says that you know, even if he's having his best day, he would not have won the race. Like Drugs did not make him an instantaneous... Yeah champion in his sport maybe are the other people doing drugs quite possibly 
Another very important takeaway. Brian Fogle never beats a drug test in this process. Right. He is never tested. They did not actually yeah. test at this race where testing was advertised. It was only a, you know, a scare tactic deterrent. Plus, the six months of which he is doping, there's no out-of-competition testing right. for amateur cycling. So, again, the argument of it's so easy to pass drug tests. In this scenario where you don't actually get tested, yeah, that's really easy to beat. And if they would have actually tested, he knew there's a one-week period during this race in which they may test me. Yeah. So he had you know six months to prepare to train hard on drugs to know, okay, this takes this many days to clear, this takes this many days to clear, and that's what they're testing his urine for, you know, to, to find out the difference of... Because I'd imagine that's just sort of individual body chemistry sure, and, yeah. and stuff of it takes one person six days to clear and another person nine days, so they could take it up to as close, uh, take it as close to the race as possible. Yeah. But he didn't have to worry about out of competition testing. He wasn't putting his his name, you know, updating like Marissa does this every every day that she, you know, if we're traveling or, or whatever, updates on her Adams app. This is 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 where I'm staying. Tonight, this is where you can find me from 6 to 7 a.m. tomorrow. And, you know, Brian Fogel was not having to do that. Yeah. Drug testing that where you know, like, this is the one day, the day of the competition, is the only day I can potentially be tested. Yes, that is easy to beat. That is having a calendar and knowing how to add and subtract. Right, right. That, that's a big, that's a huge takeaway because it's, those are two very different things. Yes. The, the out of competition r- random, is it, well, First of all, that term is wrong. People especially like to refer to random testing. There's no such thing as random drug testing. Yeah. Everything is unannounced drug yes. testing. So there's no unannounced drug testing for him. He has a specific day and time, and then unfortunately it's just a ruse anyways because yeah. there's no testing. But, yeah, this is a very – two very different things there. He's not, he's not circumventing or passing through or, you know, unassigned or un- unannounced drug testing during the off-season or off-times. Yeah. So two important takeaways from sort of this first quarter or third of the movie is that Brian Fogel makes nominal improvements as a cyclist, really no competitive improvement. He does not do better Mm -hmm. in the same race on drugs than he did the year before off of drugs. Yes, mechanical problems uh, contributed to that, but he says himself that, you know, it it wasn't this like magic bullet kind of that he thought it was going to be, that he could have been younger yeah, he, yeah, I think in it he says like he could have been 21 years old and on all the tests in EPO that he wants, and he still isn't a pro cyclist. He's still not the Tour de France champion. So those are two very important takeaways. He never beat any drug tests, and it didn't instantaneously make him a super competitor. And I'm assuming that before he start, set out to make this movie and had $350,000 to work towards this, that he didn't have a professional coach and a professional nutritionist uh, let alone people analyzing his urine and, and blood for all kind of different hormonal levels. Right. So yeah, for sure. I, yeah, I, it's like it, it, it doesn't make you. It's it's not. He had like a <laughs> flop play and movie, I think, before. Yeah, yeah. Ju- um, Jutopia. Jutopia. Yes, uh, which apparently got a one percent on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> oh, brutal. <laughs> brutal. But it was a good play, but the movie version yeah, of one percent. Yeah. Jennifer Garner play. Look at that. <laughs> so. At, at that point, though, sort of after the the bike race, and uh, he goes to visit Rodchenkov in Russia, and this this is the point in the story where I, I know in his own creation of the movie from articles we've read, the whole the whole thing takes a turn. It's not right. it's not super size me for steroids anymore. Now it's like holy shit, there's some stuff going down. Well, because at the time. At the time he was doing it, the German documentary yes. came out about about this whole thing, about the the widespread doping um, in Russia and this whole systematic thing and everything. Uh, and he's in he's in Russia. He kind of sees this and you know realizes Rodchenkov's like you know uh, maybe he the editing is you know he told him what it was going on, but like you know he's there's a movie about him now and everyone knows what this guy is and what's going on there, so. That's when he just, you know, kind of turns and the story shifts to being basically about Rodchenkov and, and what's going on in, 
in you know the entirety of Russian doping and the, the, the machine behind it. And if you're interested in seeing that movie, uh, we have not watched that no. one. That is probably on the to-dos in the, in the next week or so. But uh, it was made by the German broadcaster ARD, and I believe it is called How Russia Makes Its Champions. Or, yeah, The Doping Secret, How Russia Creates Its Champions. Uh, hopefully it has subtitles, otherwise it's going to yeah. be really weird it's to German, watch. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... So, yeah, that comes out. There's some whistleblowers in that. People who the movie is not released until they are removed from from the country. Um, because as it becomes very clear oh. through the rest of the movie, Russia ain't playing no shit. <laughs> they ain't never been about playing no shit they when it never. comes to doping and getting found out about that. Yep. Um, a lot of people having heart attacks. <laughs> yeah, the uh, so so it continues with with more and more information. Radchenkov uh, fleeing to the United States to become a state's witness for the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice. You know, all these investigations going on. Uh, WADA commissions investigations. I guess U.S. Department of Justice investigations of Russia of doping allegations, of the organization, corruption, state-sponsored aspect of it that ends up resulting in kind of a whole lot of nothing. You know, track, yeah. track got banned, weightlifting didn't compete, but the exact number, it was like 250 of 380 yeah. Russian Olympians were still allowed to compete in yeah. the Olympics after uh, this independent commission found, you know, 100% of doping samples yeah. had been tampered with that, that they, you know, uh, it's ridiculous. 100% every, yeah. I mean, yeah, the sending and not even, I don't even think the Russian lifters were banned. They just chose not to attend. They, the decision was for them not to attend. My assumption is that they maybe knew this is probably not going to be good if we go yeah. with the current situation that happened. Because of all the sports that would potentially benefit most from doping, weightlifting is pretty high <laughs> on that list. Yeah. They're like, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll send the rhythmic gym, yeah. <laughs> gymnasts. Yeah. They'll be, they'll be a little slower and they won't perform as well, but yeah. they won't be, you know, you're not going to have some Russian dude go in there and snatch 150 when he was doing 185 before. Yeah. And... So a little bit more on the on the story of you know what they were blowing the whistle on and everything, and it goes back to 2008. And and in it they talk about how China is this mass producer of anabolic steroids at pharmaceutical grade in in labs and all that stuff. The IOC says, hey, you guys are hosting the Olympics this year. You got to knock this shit out. They stop doing that. At that point, um, steroid production become goes underground on the mass scale, and when you think that you're getting, you know, a 10 milligram Anavar tablet, you know, maybe it's eight milligrams of Anavar and a two milligrams of something else. And, you know, this clears in this time and this clears in this time, but you have no way of knowing. And I've had a very high level Russian athlete tell me about that exact issue, how it was so difficult to find, you know, pure substances for performance enhancement in Russia and, you know, that really made it a lot harder to cheat. Yeah. It was a lot harder to, <laughs> yeah. to figure out when you needed to come off when you didn't know exactly what you were coming off. And that is sort of where uh, Rodchenkov sort of rose in power inside the Russian anti-doping, anti-anti-doping world. That's anti, what I anti, Yeah, I guess that's really what it is, anti-WADA. <laughs> yeah, the anti-anti-doping world. Um, and sort of surpasses the the other figure who was the leader at the time whose name escapes me, but uh, Portugal, 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 yeah. Portugal, something like that. Yeah, I can't remember now. Yeah, and and at that point you also see the the corruption beginning to just get laid out. I mean, there, yeah. uh, you know, this rivalry is created, and and Rodchenkov gets thrown in jail and gets thrown in mental institutions, and yeah. Like then, what, was yeah. he doing stuff illegally? Yes, probably. But, I mean, yeah. I feel like the word "illegal" doesn't belong in the Russian vocabulary. <laughs> it's just kind of like punishable or not punishable, yeah. or punishable at this moment or not, right? But yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah. I mean, 
they, they, the rivalry ensues, right? And then, you know, long story short on that, he ends up, Rodchenkov ends up back in power in 2012, right? Yes. Back as the head of the Water Lab in Russia and, and involved in it. And that, to me, is an interesting, yeah, I was talking earlier with Chad about it, it's an interesting, like, perspective as to, to, like, clearly this guy is dirty before he's, he's been, I mean, there's several things. One is that he's, he's clearly not playing by the, the official rules, he's playing by Russia's rules. He's put into power, I think, by WADA. I'm not entirely yes. clear that. My, he's, my impression is that Rodchenkov is an employee of WADA right. who runs the WADA lab in Russia. That, you know, the U.S. has WADA labs here that are run by WADA employees, not USADA employees. So Rodchenko was not in, not in the, in the chain of Minister of Sport, uh, Mikhail Mutko, Minister of Sport, and then, you know, Deputy Minister of Sport and the USADA side of things. Uh, He is an employee of WADA, but... It's all very murky. It's, yeah, it's hard to know exactly. Anyways, he gets back in power. He gets put back in this position, this role. And then he's basically given a chance to redeem himself or, or whatever, capitalize on this from Russia's standpoint. And now he's the guy who's in charge of, of making sure athletes pass tests. And Rodchenkov definitely fancies himself a scientist. Yeah, he, that's, he, yeah. He is about beating the test in the sense of, you know, we're going to – test ourselves and come off at the right time and we know they can test for this compound you know you have to come off at this time and so on and so forth what what i think is interesting and you see this a lot in the film and just like this the subtlety of the way he communicates with uh fogel and, and kind of how they talk about a lot of stuff there isn't a sense of like like apathy towards the sport like oh whatever everyone's on drugs who cares they really like he really truly believes in all of the things that I think we believe in here about sport and like the the character and and pushing and and winning and this fight and this victory, like you know he talked about like when he's like kind of doing the race like kind of motivate him and like talk mm-hmm. about it and it isn't just like a joke to them like even though they're all everyone is doping yeah. on a grand scale, they're not they're not they don't look at it as anything but that's just how that's just what sports is right I mean yeah. A very interesting thought to me that there there didn't seem to be any sense of like disillusionment with sport because it's just totally corrupt and and whatever. Yeah, if if anything, there's more lots of pride in it. Yeah, yeah. more pride in it. So Rodchenkov is about beating the test by coming off at the right time by taking the right compounds that that clear faster and that sort of thing. You know, so, something that I've always thought was interesting. And if you're familiar with with Balco, Victor Conti, uh, the book Game of Shadows, um, Patrick Arnold uh, was the chemist, and and that whole scandal in the U.S. with Marion Jones, Barry Bonds, all these people, they were taking drugs that could not be tested for, that the that USADA and WADA did not know what they were, hence they could not test for them. It's surprising to me that that. And, and maybe this is happening and they just haven't caught them yet, but that Russia would go the the route of, all right, let's just make sure we come off on time, and then the latter route that we'll discuss in a minute of, of another, another way to beat the test right. versus, you know, we're state sponsoring all this stuff and putting so much support towards, towards the athletes, and it, it is substantial. I mean, Klokov told me that, that the senior national – Lifters were getting paid eight to twelve thousand yeah. dollars a month U.S. and eight to twelve thousand dollars a month U.S. in Russia it I, translates I, to seventeen million dollars <laughs> a year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, the, the highest stipend that any U.S. lifter actually probably gets is thirty-five hundred, yeah, something like that. So they're they're getting you know two to three times that, but in a place where the cost of living is. Pennies, yeah, a dollar. I, it would be like a, a U.S. lifter getting paid, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month. I think, yeah, probably. And uh, so they're putting a ton of support towards these sports. Why not just just task a chemist or team of chemists to make something that they don't know how to test for? But that is not the route yeah. that they've chosen to get to go, or it just hasn't been found out yet. And 
I kind of always thought that China was maybe more likely to be doing that. Um, and it wasn't that they were coming off or that kind of thing, that, but that they were just taking stuff that people didn't know how to test for. And then when we saw the string of positives, uh, retroactive positives from Beijing, that sort of changed my mind on that. Yeah. But, you know, there's also things we've heard from, from people who are in the know type of people that... The, the, what they're saying they test positive for, they weren't actually taking. Yeah, that's and tough. It's a, yeah. it's it's corruption in every yeah. direction. And there's so many lies and so much like yeah. not. No one's going to tell you exactly what's going on, but uh, I, that kind of corroborates too a lot of what I've heard from from my experience with a lot of the Eastern European guys that that there was no secret drug mm-hmm. that no one knew about. You know, it was purely just cleverness and ingenuity passing tests, you know? Or, I mean, more, even more corrupt than just, just people being, you know, avoiding testing, right? Yeah. And, but then from the, the corruption on the other side, the WADA corruption side, or the yeah. IOC corruption side, that's when you get the Ben Ben Johnson, Charlie Francis kind of thing, where Charlie Francis is like, stenazolol? My guys, yeah. I don't want my guys on stenazolol on race day. It makes them tight. He's not saying no... He wasn't on drugs. Right. He say no. He wasn't taking that. You know, it, he didn't test positive for that. They're making that up. Yeah. Uh, and Abu Jay said too. A lot of his yeah. guys failed. They all fell for diuretics, and and his thing was they wouldn't. They didn't take diuretics. Yeah. They 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 were taking stuff, but you know they were they were clean. Um, and this is obviously all pre two thousand eight, yeah. pre the time where you you wouldn't have been able to get. Well, yeah. they made the they the stories I was told they, they actually had a factory that was making the drugs for them in Bulgaria, and then in like 1988 they the, there was a ship. When you say factory, do you mean bathtub? A bathtub, <laughs> <laughs> a bathroom factory. Uh, yeah, and they had like you know they just had exactly what they were getting, and they knew exactly what it was because it was being manufactured there. So yeah, so that takes us to the point in the movie they. they uh, Rodchenkov is is running the lab. He's he's back doing his thing. He's the man when it comes to Russian anti anti doping, um, both anti doping and anti anti doping. And then they come up to the 2014 Sochi Winter Olympics. And this, I think, you know, for as as much as Max and I have talked about this stuff, and people we know who who kind of know and and stuff we've been around. The part that was the most eye-opening, I think, to the both of us was the scale of corruption oh, yeah. that Russia employs at the Sochi Olympics. And uh, Real Sports on HBO with Bryant Gumbel had some specials uh, about this. And and you can probably, you know, YouTube all kind of different little pieces from Vice and, and all that sort of stuff about... You know, one any any Olympics, anyone who's hosting the Olympics bribed the shit out of people to be able to yeah. do that. Same thing with the World Cup. You know that that's how you get it. You bribe people. You know, you pay people off, and then you you know this was the case for 2008 Beijing. It was definitely the case for 2014 in Sochi. You employ this imminent domain type of thing to just move people out of their homes. Uh, this happened in Rio too. Like you guys get out of here. This is Olympic stadiums now. In Olympic villages, and uh, no, you don't get shit for this. You're just out. You know, you're homeless now. <laughs> and so, so we incredible. Have it pretty lo- bad here in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so incredible levels of corruption to get the Olympics, and and to you know the amount of of tax money being used to build these stadiums yeah. that you know a year later, two years later, are abandoned, are in you yeah. know ill repair, and to Russia. And and to Putin and and the way that real sports frames it and and some of my takeaway from from this movie too is that sport there is a political tool. It is Rocky IV yeah. in 1985. You know, in the height of the Cold War, but reversed. Know, yeah, it's it, not Apollo Creed. <laughs> you know, how many gold medals did we win versus how many yeah. gold medals did you win? Well, we're a better, more powerful country because yeah. we hosted the Olympics and we won more medals, and that's a really big deal. And and that I think is is that idea in Russia, in probably China, two thousand eight Olympics is has to exist for the type of corruption. You know, for the the 
conspiracy, the grandeur of conspiracy yeah. that oh. occurred at the Sochi Olympics. And the movie does a wonderful job through these illustrations and, and, and graphics and stuff of playing, you know, playing the whole thing out. Hundreds of KGB officers being employed by yeah. Russian anti anti doping. Right. Yeah. You know, he said there's a hundred in the water lab. A hundred and fifty yeah. people working there were for the FSB or the, the KGB. Yeah. The, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So you can talk about tests are easy to pass. You you know this clears fast. Don't you know that clears fast. I come off of this whenever you know and. Besides that, for the most part, with real out of competition testing, which does not exist in Russia, you know, does not exist in so many of these countries because Rusada ain't trying to catch their people; they're trying to protect them. You know, as this movie clearly illustrates. Yeah. And if WADA comes to try and test them, well, guess what? They got to get a, a visa to get into the country, and they just delay that process. Delay, delay, delay. Hey, are you guys clean yet? Okay, now you can come in. Or, hey, are yeah. you guys clean yet? No, you're not. Sorry, Wada, you're not allowed in. All right. And so, yeah, that stuff without out-of-competition testing is easy enough to beat. But then 2014 Sochi, Rodchenkov says, you know, we need to come off at this point, and then they'll compete and be clean and test clean. And the way that the movie frames it, Vladimir Putin basically says, fuck that. We're rolling in hot. Yeah, we are <laughs> guns a-blazing, <laughs> juiced to the gills. He said, I don't want to take any chances of us not winning the most medals, of not winning the most gold medals, of not kicking the most ass here on the home turf to showcase the yeah. mighty power of Mother Russia yep. to the whole world. But he Drinking from the fire hose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going all in and just find a way for them to be on the drugs the whole time. Yeah. And, you know, newsflash Vladimir Putin, no one gives a shit about the Winter Olympics. <laughs> yeah, I think Chad and I are both, Chad and I are both in st- st- solid agreement that, I mean, while from a personal standpoint, that's fucking cool. Like, let's all, everyone gets loaded up and goes in and does it. But for skiing, like, yeah. let's do it for on cross the, country skiing. Like, yeah, I want to see the weightlifting and the shot put, the hundred. Yeah. Like, let's do it on the cool sport, the cool, the cool Olympics, right? Yeah, <laughs> the, like, uh, yeah. If if you're gonna be so corrupt, at least really make it worth it and do it with the Summer Olympics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because the the clip that they show in the movie, where it's uh, Russia on the whole podium, you know, yeah. bronze, bronze, silver, and gold. I believe it was in the fifty kilometer cross-country skiing. Right, which is kind of like, eh. No one outside of the cross-country skiing world. And Nine fans. Yeah. There's less There's less people that watch <laughs> that than listen to the podcast. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I, I'll take that back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Putin says, hey, guys, they're not coming off. We're not taking any chances. We have to win, so they have to be on. Figure out a way to beat the test anyways. And that's when... The it goes from a cal- yeah, yeah from a calendar about this is the time you stop taking test and this is the time you stop taking Anavar and this is the time you stop taking EPO to how the fuck do we get this fancy <laughs> bottle top <laughs> off of this specially made bottle? Literally, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went from like let's okay here's the science about like what kind of screwdriver do we need to pry this <laughs> yeah. cap off? <laughs> it's a combination of a flathead and a Phillips, <laughs> but. So there are these special bottles and, and people, uh, you know, who compete in weightlifting and compete in the, the higher uplifters in the, uh, the USAPL IPF who get the WADA tests know what this bottle yeah. looks like. Uh, they call it a Berig kit. Yeah, Berig kit. And it's a special bottle with this locking cap on it that you're supposed to have to destroy the bottle yeah. to get the sample out. It's like very tamper evident. So if you try to open it, it's obvious that somebody tried to do something. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not that it's like an indestructible bottle or it's hard to open. It's just that it's very obvious when you try to open it if it's been tampered with. Yeah. So you could just inspect the bottle with, you know, basically just look at it, I guess, and assume it would be pretty easy to tell if someone's yeah. changed the caps. Yeah, basically the cap is broken off. Right. Or it's sealed yeah, still. It's sealed, you, yeah. know, like you seal it and that's, and that's it. So... It, it does not explain how they get the, the top off. Um, 
you know, it seems like as they talk about these scratch marks inside of it, yeah. that maybe they developed some tool to do that. They don't explain it. Maybe they... There's a know. couple of theories, actually, yeah. I was reading about uh, last night. The, some people were speculating that they broke the bottle itself and then removed the pieces and replaced the bottle with another one. Other people are saying they did the same with the cap, but because there's a serial code or a barcode on the cap, they like may have had to... imprinted yeah. into the glass of it. Yes, yeah. so you'd have to, like, remake the exact number again in another bottle. Uh, very interesting. They had maybe someone so speculated they had some special tools manufactured yeah. that allowed them to remove the cap, but either way, a very interesting problem. Yeah, so the, the gist of it is is samples get, well, before the Olympics... All the athletes get clean for a bit. They they pee. They keep those clean samples. Store those away in the in the secret KGB storage refrigerator. Then the Olympics come, bringing the B samples in, bringing the A samples in. They get split onto these two carts. Russian guy slips the Russian athletes' B samples into his lab coat. A samples go over here. They go and change the B samples, bring those back. And now the A samples need to get changed too, but they've got the special bottle. But well, let's just slip this bottle <laughs> through this hole in the wall. And but a, a you know a shadowy, shady yeah. conspir- conspiracy theory thing that could exist is what they were doing. Oh, it's, yeah. the most the, yeah. to the absolute degree of of the most fucked up, corrupt shit you could possibly do. Slipping a bottle into a fucking hole in the wall, a, a, a glory hole of yeah, clean urine. Yeah, three in the morning. Yeah, and then some guy taking that to a special laboratory and secretly opening it, bringing it back. I mean, just like to the absolute. It, I, what's interesting to me is that it's it's the most primitive solution when you think about it. It's just we'll just switch the urine out for clean urine, and and that sounds like well, all these measures that have been taken by WADA or. or the anti-doping to prevent that very simple process, which is like, you can be as dirty as you want, just use clean urine. They just found a way to sort of circumvent all these little <laughs> tiny things in yeah. place that would prevent that from happening. As, and it goes along with, as far as like the specific gravity and adding sodium chloride to change, right, yeah. change the specific gravity of, of the urine so it matches up with the original sample because th- that testing process process is very involved yeah. for yeah, you know, and Marissa's gotten the the water panel tests, and they're in there for a long time, you know, because there's so many procedures to it and safeguards for the athlete, uh, you know, to avoid tampering, but also, you know, just safeguards to the whole process. And in the movie, they're they're in the meeting. Brian Fogel is is in the meeting and kind of becomes when when it becomes apparent that shit is going down. You know, guys are having heart attacks. The yeah. head of Rusada has a heart attack a week after this gets revealed. Yeah, just, and another high up person also has a heart attack. Yeah, um, well, his heart exploded <laughs> when the bullet hit it. <laughs> heart attack. And so they get Rodchenkov out of Russia, and and Brian kind of becomes his, you know, facilitator for all this legal work and and uh, helping him work with the Department of Justice, and, and they release this information to the New York Times. But, uh, you know, once once they realize that, that shit is yeah. just going down... Yeah, it's going south. Yeah, it's... Uh, it, it really is a remarkable, remarkable story in it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, he leaves Russia, right? And yeah. he, he kind of... He's kind of forced to leave his wife and kids at home, and, and that's just like... I mean... It's, I mean you know, who knows where he was at with the, all that, but like that's that's a very like a challenging thing to do because you're leaving them in basically the most dangerous place they yeah. could be, right? Yeah, that's a that's a scary thought. Yeah, they're they're definitely taking their anti anti doping very extremely seriously. seriously, all for some really non non existent glory that uh, yeah. comes from well i think there's 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 obviously the undertone of the whole documentary and not not to get anything political but there's a lot of the like obviously the russian thing and whatever's going on in the news now with russia and collusion stuff mm-hmm. so all of that i think plays a big role in probably Probably to some degree how the film came out this time and, yeah. and those kind of things. If they're willing to go this far right, in for sport, 
would they go that far? And yeah, other, yeah, I mean, for cross country skiing medals, <laughs> what else will they do? Do a lot of work for? We're totally losing our our cross country skiing audience. What if there was a huge, <laughs> the huge cross country skiing? People have been waiting for the article on general training for cross country skiing for years now. Uh, not coming out. Hypertrophy, <laughs> hypertrophy for the biathlon. You're never getting it. That's not true. You might, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, so I think there's probably there's probably a big thing there. In the movie too, they kind of allude to the the the, the political tool may be more an asset to him, to Putin for his own people for Russia yeah, more they, so than the talk rest about of the that. world, right? Where where you know also he, the the real sports talk seems to talk more about how the, Putin wanted the Olympics to be like show the whole world like you know Russia's doing great we're right. we're still powerful and. And everything, and then in Icarus, they basically say, you know, that Putin's approval rating, which that part is a clip from uh, from the Real Sports episode, because oh, really? I just recognize the the, the graphic the, or whatever the narrator's voice, oh. but that his approval rating had been kind of falling for a couple of years, and then it's like Olympics, whew, yeah, ninety five percent approval rating. Russians love their Olympics. Yeah. Oh, everybody loves me again. Well. Fuck you, Ukraine. Yeah, and then they may attack Ukraine. Yeah, so that that saying that he used, you know, that that them beating the tests was so important to gain this political power, so he could be more aggressive. I guess you got to think about Rodchenkov's position there, knowing that you're essentially the linchpin that allowed that situation to occur. Because if they had all lost and failed drug tests, yeah, that would have just been a totally different world for a lot of people in Ukraine. Yeah. I would, yeah, imagine within what the, goes through his. <laughs> well, you can, I, yeah, I didn't even think about it until now, but you could imagine Rodchenkov's well, and, and psyche. It, it seems like Rodchenkov acknowledges that in there yeah. that he has remorse and and For what's happened, and maybe yeah. that's part of the reason why he wanted to to make this information public and and go to New York Times and the Department of Justice with it. Now, it's it's a bit unclear to me in it. What the U.S. Department of Justice is investigating? Yeah, there was a lot of stuff that probably doesn't. Uh, that, like what? Why yeah. he's getting a deal? Well, one, it begs the bigger question: is why does the U.S. Department of Justice give a fuck about steroids at all? Let alone steroids in Russia. Right. Why? Where is the jurisdiction there? I mean, it's stupid enough when they're spending millions and millions of dollars to put Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens on trial yeah. because who gives a fuck? Right. But <laughs> at least they're yeah. Americans. Right. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. It's just a very, yeah, it's the conspiracy thing, right? Yeah. They just want to, they just want to charge people with broad conspiracy so they can get them right. Yeah. Get them for the sake of getting them, get them because they think it's still 1982. <laughs> because it matters. And, yeah. And you know, the Olympic boycotts I just think are a big I, political move. The problem and stuff, is that but, people in the just in the department of justice at the highest levels have never actually been to West side. So they don't know what goes <laughs> on there. That's the biggest problem. If you just went there, You'd realize it's not. I mean, you'd see it. It's not a big <laughs> deal, guys. <laughs> yeah. So the the scale of efforts and the the political implications of beating the the testing and it pr propping Putin up and Russia up in in the global political community is you know, probably ab above Max's and my pay grade to to yeah. discuss. But uh, what what is interesting about it is the implications for the rest of sport and the rest of the sporting world. Um, this corruption was so far reaching, was, you know, the highest of high levels in in Russia. I mean, Putin is, has got to be second, third most powerful uh -oh. you know, political figure in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he's getting involved in, in this. So it. it it begs the question, you know, how how does this go in, in other countries? Obviously, Russia sees sports and the Olympics as this political tool, a, a grand show in Sochi Olympics and a grand showing by the athletes there was sort of this badge of honor for Russia, or in Putin's eyes for Russia in the international political community. Within Russia, it, it in, bolstered his approval rating to be able to make this attack on on the Ukraine. So do other countries see beating doping tests as a means to an end of political success, of nationalism, 
of you know we won a bunch of medals and now everyone around the world thinks that we're a great country yeah and because if they do and it's likely that Russia is not the only person who you know the only country who has that kind of feeling then it's not out of the question that other countries are having you know far reaching up to the president prime minister of their country helping them beat drug tests does china see sport and the olympics as this big political tool and that their success in sport means that they're more that's a very what do you think would happen if because let's assume that's the case if it's happening in in russia it's, it's happening everywhere right let's assume that all these these powers that are dominant even including here, let's just assume everybody's in there. If you eliminated the possibility of drug failures, let's just say you allow drug use in sport, what does that suddenly do to the landscape of, of do sports just become kind of irrelevant after that? Because Well, that, that seems like it's the argument that, that Dick Pound, uh, who was like the former head of Water or Usada, and mostly just has a funny name. Not as impressive as the name. <laughs> yeah. the, the man is not as impressive <laughs> as the name. You think that there's there's like a European guy with the equivalent name? Dick Kilogram. <laughs> Dick Kilo. <laughs> Dick Kilo. <laughs> <laughs> but they they probably have a different uh, a, a different word. There's than one Dick. in each guy. There's one in the UK. Dick Stone. <laughs> Stone Maybe Stone Richard Stone. Richard Stone. Richard Stone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's. I, I am. Because if you can't, if you don't have, if you have, if you can't show anyone like, okay, everyone gets to take drugs, so anybody can basically, any of the talented people can basically yeah. do really well, and it's going to be a crapshoot because then it really comes down to everyone's on drugs, so that there's no advantage now to the yeah. drugs that you like. One person's not going to have them, and the other person is. You're going to come down to finding special people, but it won't exist like where you have a full team of freaks, right? I yeah. Mean, with the exception of probably the United States having such a massive pool to draw from that you're going to have a lot more talented people here coming up to that level. Yeah. And what I was going to say is, is Dick Pound tries to argue that in the, in the movie, well, if, if we let everyone take drugs or if everyone's taking drugs or when the, when, uh, Fogel is in the meeting with all those WADA yeah. people and the, all these WADA employees high up, uh, level one yeah, folks shocked. are just like, holy shit, they just beat us at every turn. You right. know, like, what are we doing here? Right, right. And and they try and make the argument that it's cheating the spectator and, and stuff. And I don't think that the spectators give a shit. Nah. I think it's it's sort of like an ignorance is bliss situation. For sure. CrossFit Games last weekend. CrossFit's drug testing policy is total, complete it's a joke. bullshit. It's a joke. And... The people love watching the CrossFit games. People love watching the CrossFit games yeah. because most of them don't understand that it's complete and total bullshit because they get fed these, you know, 18th place at regionals tested positive and this 17th place masters catching guy. To, yeah. But no, none of the people above them like yeah. because they control the, the results. So I, I think that's a scenario on a, on a micro scale. You know, compared to the Olympic movement and everything, where they're showing that the fans don't really care. Well, look at like football and baseball. Yeah, like, I mean, no one, no one really gives a shit if like you know, Sean Merriman's taking a bunch of Nandrolone. Like, yeah, they get four so four what? game suspension. Yeah. and does that? I, I mean, who even has tested positive? Like I Sean, Sean yeah. Merriman. Yeah, That's he the tested last one I've ever. positive. <laughs> I know there was a guy from the from the Cowboys this year who will have his second suspension, ten games. Four games last year, now 10 games for testing positive again. A track athlete, a weightlifter, they're done. Their it's career over, is yeah. done. Justin Gatlin, you know, two positive tests. He didn't have a lifetime ban because the first one, it's like his freshman year of college for Adderall, you know, not having a TUA, right. TUE for Adderall, he got a six-month. No and, TUE for Adderall. Is, that's a, that'll get you. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, later had a more serious suspension for, for anabolics. He was getting booed by the, the by the entire stadium. Yeah, like those guys get crucified in in track. That's brutal. Where you know baseball and and football, no one really bats an eye at it. It's yeah, a, the NFL doesn't seem concerned about a, a 
you know, losing fans because people are, are popping for drugs. They just want to watch yeah. the biggest, fastest, gnarliest dudes ever Destroy knock the shit other. out of each other. You blow <laughs> each other's brains up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're more concerned with the blow- brains blowing out these yeah, days. Yeah, that's, that's a little more of an issue now. But Yeah. So I think that's interesting, right? So you assume, like, if you get rid of drug failure, if you just can't... F- it's not an issue. Drugs are whatever. Take them, don't take them, no one yeah. cares. Like, track in the 80s, so popular. Yeah. Really no positive tests. Right. And so what, what then becomes of what then becomes of the sport, right? It, it becomes a, a spectacle, which it already is, I mean, because they're yeah. already doing this. And the political, the political power, the tool is completely gone because... The, the corruption is gone. Right. The corruption is gone. So now you can't just cheat your way through, right? And you're forced to be, you know, the sport... It would actually make sport more fair because yeah, and people I've, would basically have to develop more ingenious, more in, more creative ways to both use the drugs and train and develop results that would rely more on hum, human ingenuity than I think, you know, well, the same ingenuity going towards passing tests would now be yeah. directed towards <laughs> the actual training process. Yeah. the uh, And I've said that before. The, if you want to have fair a level playing field, you say, do whatever you want. Because someone, some place, some country, some people are always going to get around it. Whether it's Balco designer steroids that they don't know how to test for, whether it's coming off at the at the right time and, and avoiding out of competition testing through customs and, and different levels of corruption there, or whether it's fucking 100 KGB officers making a special tool to take the cop cap off this bottle and switch it with the other bottle in the middle of the night, they're going to beat the test. I mean, WADA officials in that in the movie are flabbergasted. by the, They're just hanging with their jaw open like, we're not even fucking close yeah. to stopping it. Yeah. I hope that I really hope that bottle cap opening thing is like a Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> they, it took 30 minutes, like a bowling ball has to fall on a string <laughs> to open it. Um, here's a question that uh, for you is what what ramifications do you think the from 1968 till now the reliance on the fact that you're going to be doped has had on the Russian, the Soviet. Uh, sort of creativity in discovering the training process or, or the, the knowledge of training. Have, have they just, has the model been sort of stilted because of this? Because, like, like, do you think they didn't get further along and discover more, create more, or that that's been hindered by this? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I would say, and we've talked about this before, as the U.S. has foreign weightlifting coaches come over and and or coaches who are still coaching in other countries, and they think that U.S. weightlifters are all on drugs, that we're just bad at weightlifting. <laughs> Where the reality of it is, is no, we're actually probably the best at drug-free weightlifting. Right. yeah, for sure. At training drug-free weightlifters. And if all of weightlifting did, you know, tomorrow become drug-free, that the U.S. knows how to do that better. We don't know yeah. how to play the the game that the other countries are playing better than they do, but we know how to play the drug-free game better right. better than they do. So I I think a lot of training on drugs, off off of drugs, is not by, you know, not changes of type of training, sure. but changes of magnitude right. of training. So whether, whether that's a coach having to relearn and refine the ranges that are, you know, appropriate for overloading and fatigue management for their athletes now... And instead of doing, you know, six triples at eighty-five percent, now they can do three triples at at seventy-seven right. percent or something. Right, right. It's, it's changes like that. Um, you know, does it discount the the learnings and the and the teachings of someone like Dr. Bondarchuk and special strength right. exercises? Because if if Yuri Sadiq and and Lipinov are on a bunch of steroids, yeah, maybe they don't have to do as much general strength training. Right. They can just spend a lot more time on special strength stuff. That's that's a very good question. One I yeah. you know, don't have a huh. I don't think there's an easy answer for. Cool, yeah. But so the the last point that I want to talk about, you know, is how far reaching this was, and I started to touch on it when. You, surprisingly or unsurprisingly went on a few tangents was if Russia sees this as sport as a political tool and they are willing to have such 
uh, you know, far reaching corruption to defeat drug tests. Does China see sport as a similar political political tool? And does that motivate them to do the same type of thing? Does Jamaica see the success of their sprinters as something that bolsters their, you know, national profile? Um, with track track and field world championships going on now, or just, just having finished, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about Justin Gatlin defeating Usain Bolt and what was Bolt's last individual race and how Gatlin's tested positive twice. And, you know, why is he being allowed to race? People were pissed. They were booing him in the, in the stands. He was getting no love. If you look at the list of the top 50 fastest hundred meter times oh, ever, yeah. top 50 fastest hundred meter times ever, and you cross off, so this would be every fast time that Usain Bolt has run on there. You know, every fast time that Justin Gatlin, Tyson Gay, Asafa Powell, Nesta Carter, uh, Johan Blake, all these people, Tim Montgomery, and you cross off all the names, all the people who have tested positive on it, of the top 50 fastest times ever, you know how many names are left? Usain Bolt, the only one. Yeah. And And this isn't to say, you know, I, I can't on one hand say if about USAPL lifters and, and USA weightlifting athletes, if they're passing the test, they're clean. And on the other hand say, well, Usain Bolt's the only person who's not tested positive, so he must be dirty. But that has to be with the understanding that Usain Bolt is the biggest thing in, in – yeah. Jamaica, like he is, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. He's making their economy kind of, <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Like he's getting all the national governmental support possible, and the extent of that governmental support, if if they want to, if Jamaica wants to do it like Russia, and and this isn't even for fifty different athletes or a hundred different athletes, it's just protecting one fucking guy. Yeah, you know that they can let all the other people test positive, and they're just like. Here you go, Wada. Here's a million dollars. Here's another million. Right. Here's another million. Just don't let him test positive. Because you think fucking track and field wants Usain Bolt to test positive? And that's no. the argument I, I hear the most is if, if Bolt tests positive, then track is dead. Because yeah. we've had so many. Yeah. Everyone tests positive. You know, that they just they can't sustain it anymore. That he's the one shining protected star and that, you know, he can do no wrong. And now he's retiring, so it, it kind of doesn't matter. Yeah. But that's a it's a... I mean, therein lies the, the, the whole issue, right? Yeah. Is that you can't, you just can't get around, yeah, I mean, it's the whole double speak, right? Yeah. It's, you well, just, yeah. And that, the, does the end justify the means? Right, right. To, to Russia, the end of, the end that was invading the Ukraine or bolstering their political profile on the international stage justified the means of you know, this insane level of corruption of people getting paid off of people, you know, sneaking the, the urine stuff from people getting fucking murdered from people losing their life because, you know, they didn't go along with the plan as they were, as they were supposed to. Does the end justify the means for other countries in regards to anti, anti doping Yeah, is, is a big, a big question. It's, it's one worth, Discussing it's it's uh, something you know. Watch watch the movie, listen to this podcast. Let us know your thoughts in the yeah. comments because you know, it's it's a it's a discussion. I guess that's a bit bigger than sports. It's bigger than at yeah, least a, sets and reps and and yeah. you know if you should bend your knees or your hips first in the squat type of type of talk. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a huge philosophical discussion there. Anything else about Icarus? Uh, if you're, I'm not sure the age, I don't know what's rated, probably PG-13 or maybe yeah. R. No, it might have been some bad. vulgarity. Uh, definitely a lot of Eastern European <laughs> half nudity. Very <laughs> Eastern European, no shirt. <laughs> Many times by Rochenkov. Excellent um, mustache. Uh, I, phenomenal I, mustache. When I saw some of the previews, particularly of the, the scene where him and Brian Fogel are sitting across the table yeah. from each other doing like a oh, more interview style. <laughs> I, I had seen the interviews and I was like, didn't quite know what the movie was. And I was like, is this like a dramatization of this whole situation? And I was like, this guy's got to be wearing fake eyebrows and a fake mustache with those glasses. If it was, his character name in the credits would have been like generic Russian scientist or something. Yeah. Vladimir Sportsnitsky. 
Kornitsky. Yeah, it was a very good film. Yeah. I highly recommend it. Uh, I think that's probably probably all the things I can think of about it. I mean, it was it was really good. It yeah. was very very eye opening. Very very thought provoking. Yeah, and because even for you know, I think both you and I are, are cynics in this in this yeah, whole for situation, sure. but but have maybe a deeper understanding than than, yeah. than most would yeah. of of the reality of it. There were parts to both of us that were very eye opening yeah. that were like shocking. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy shit. Yeah. Crazy shit. And I, mean, I, I we mentioned this last night when we were watching like Brian Fogel at some point in this had to just be like, Holy shit. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that scene where all the water people everyone like because you kind of know it and you're in you're met the people involved at the base level. Yeah. To to sit there and, and be like, Yeah, I mean, this has been going on for like fifty years. Yeah. And no one's like they have records of everybody back to day one. Yeah, I mean Brian Fogel was a virgin to doping. Yeah, and yeah, to come into that and just be like, yeah, he he thought he was coming in for maybe a little bit of this, and then it was just like, no, there's Caligula <laughs> level Caligula. orgies of doping going on here. You weren't ready for this kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he had to just have his mind blown by the, the uh, whole process. Yeah, brutal. Yeah. Icarus on Netflix. Check it out. Give this a listen. Let us know what you think about about our thoughts here. Uh, coming up, seminar wise, the weekend of August 25th and 26th. So about 10 days from the time that this uh, podcast is released. Max and I will be in Buffalo, New York, at Mustache Fitness and Barbell, giving our first Super Total Clinic. Yep. That's powerlifting one day, weightlifting the other day, talking about how to combine them as well, uh, train them independently and combined. So go and sign up for that. After that, I will be in Buffalo, or sorry, in Philadelphia on September 16th at Warhorse Barbell, giving a lecture on powerlifting program design, beginner, intermediate, advanced, how to apply the scientific principles of strength training, how I do it for our athletes from club powerlifting coaching all the way up to world record holders, guys and guys holding 2,300 pounds. After that, Max will be in Santa Barbara at CrossFit Santa Barbara, very creatively named, yep. on September 30th. And then he and Pomp the following weekend will be at CrossFit Park Avenue in Rochester, New York. Yep. The uh, I, I don't really think of Park Avenue when I think of Rochester. They're, I feel like it's like the poor man's Park Avenue. Yeah. I mean, it's in Rochester. It can't be out. <laughs> so you're... So Max and Pomp will be up there on October 6th for a weightlifting clinic, and then I will be in Minneapolis at the Movement Minneapolis on October 28th giving another programming uh, lecture. So go check all of those out. Plus, juggernautcoaching.com. We have multiple levels of coaching for multiple disciplines, powerlifting, weightlifting, and super total. Um, kind of whatever level you're at, beginner, intermediate, advanced, we have something that's appropriate for you. So visit juggernautcoaching.com to learn more about that. Subscribe to the YouTube. We're really proud of the content we make here. We got Shorty Sedang, world's strongest videographer, pound for pound, without a doubt. For sure. I mean, Wilkes, no no other no, videographer no. could match. There's no one. Yeah. And uh, always proud of the content we produce here. So subscribe to the channel. Tell your friends who are interested in becoming better educated about how to lift pieces of metal attached to other pieces of metal. Sometimes and rubber. The, yeah. Rubberized, rubber covered metal, <laughs> uh, and the occasional delve into you know the psyche of world leaders and the political, <laughs> global political implications of clean or dirty urine. Um, we'll the talk about that too. Yeah. Uh, this is the Jug Life podcast. If you like us, like it. Go on iTunes, give us a five star review. We're on iTunes, uh, Spotify. Google Play. We should be on iHeartRadio pretty soon. I got to email the podcast guys about that. Uh, the Stitcher app and the juglife.com. Maximum, where can they find me? You can find me you? on Instagram, max underscore ada, or on Facebook. You can email me about any of the juggernaut online coaching platforms at maxjtsstrength.com. I'm Chad Wesley Smith at Chad Wesley Smith and at Juggernaut Training. Filling up your news feed all day on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next week.